Welcome to Ellis B. Feaster's Radio Air Check and Classic TV Channel. Milt Fullerton, NBC News, Tel Aviv. Meantime, Israel has sent a parliamentary delegation off to Washington to explain why the Israelis are so dead set against that Saudi Arabian peace plan. Cameron Swayze, NBC News. until you hear this. Let me tell you what the weather is, and then you're going to hear something that'll absolutely boggle your mind. Cloudy this afternoon. Highs in the mid-40s. Partly cloudy tonight and tomorrow. Low tonight in the mid to the upper 30s. High tomorrow in the low 50s. There's a 20% precipitation. Pro that means it's going to rain. Why do they use such big words? 20% chance of rain this afternoon, tonight, and tomorrow. Are you ready, gang? This is just a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. of the Rolling Stones put together by Alan Tolls, our production man. And Alan, I want to thank you. He's sitting here in the studio with us, along with David Dalton. David Dalton is the author of the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. He is also a writer and editor. And David, welcome to the program. Thank you, Rick. Alan, I want you to jump in because you're... This is your music. I mean, I'm I'm just getting into to the Stones and Hendrix and Croce, thanks to your coaching and my son's interest now in, in my career as a broadcaster. I was telling David off the air, once again, Ron said, hey, can I cut school, Dad? And it's about time you got a good program on the air. So you know the impact of the Stones. David, the book, Alan, if you, I'd appreciate it if you jump in, because I know you got a lot of questions to ask of, of David, if you would. The book is some 187 pages long, mm -hmm. and the print is kind of small. Right. There's a lot of stuff in this book. Absolutely. 20 years jammed into that book? Absolutely. And a lot of different 
points of view. You know, we. Uh, I, I didn't want to write a straight history, a straight biography, just my point of view. Uh, it's um, Terry Southern, Anita Pallenberg, Keith Richards' uh, common law wife, has never been interviewed. Kenneth Anger, Patti Smith, people who toured with them, people who worked with them. Uh, Ted Newman Jones, who builds their guitars. I mean, there's a fold-out guitar you can you can build your own if you've got a you know a bandsaw at home and <laughs> has some screwdrivers. Um, there's a you know the uh, various points of view of the press. Uh, there's a uh, a gossip magazine has a facsimile cover, but they're all legitimate articles. UFOs are landing in my garden, says Keith Richards. Mm -hmm. Wasn't actually appeared in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. Nothing we made up there and. Uh, all the scandal stuff, and then there's a, a, a facsimile uh, cover for a fan magazine, but inside that is a whole fan magazine with all the original, you know, uh, the secret love lives of the Rolling Stones, uh, We Visit Mick at Home, um, you know, uh, My Brother Mick by Chris, and uh, etc. You know, uh, we, um, when we were doing this, we had a lot of help from collectors over the years. They've become fanatic. Stones are the most cult fanatic group ever of all time. I mean, uh, you know, the Dead, the Who, they all have uh, fanatic cult followings. The Stones have the most fanatic following. And there are collectors who, over the years, have collected enormous amounts of stuff. Tom Beach, our, basically our archivist, I absolutely had to call him because uh, that's what it was. Uh, provided um, some, um, uh, he has a room about the size of the studio here in Washington, crammed with boxes of stuff and all filed and dates. He came up to my house in New York with a huge steel trunk. You know, I thought there was a body in it or one of the stones or he just captured Mick or Keith or Bill Wyman in the box or something. I thought, what is this going to be? Inside was like a million and a half clippings. Plus boxes of fan magazines, so we, I think, have read everything that was ever written on them, and you know, uh, believe it or not, this book was twice the length at one point, and you know, it's merciful that perhaps it was cut down somewhat because you know that uh, you'd, you'd never finish reading it. I mean, uh, we did want a lot of text. That's why the text is small. We didn't want a picture book, and a lot of stuff. Um, you know, more than you could ever believe. We have to pause for a couple commercial messages. Um, and uh, we'll get back with David Dalton. It's a it's a fascinating book. I made a, a dent in it, David. I have to admit, I didn't get the book until Friday. And as I said, this is a whole new area for me going into rock music, into the Stones era. Um, we'll, and, we'll go easy on you. And, uh, okay, you know, treat me gentle, because <laughs> I just found out that Lawrence Welk wasn't a hippie. <laughs> <laughs> home, home Comfort Systems, Delaware Valley's exclusive direct factory depot for the patented Aquatilt 365 solid vinyl replacement window has an energy saver special that's really worthwhile. You get the Aquatilt window for your home. And by the way, it's 416 times more efficient than aluminum. And now you'll also get triple pane insulating glass at no extra charge. The Aquatilt is an efficient insulator with just the standard dual pane insulating glass, but now you'll get even more efficiency with the triple pain insulating glass. That's right, at no extra cost. The fuel bills are going to really come down. You call Home Comfort Systems now for a free, no obligation survey and an estimate in your home. Philadelphia, the number 632-6550. New Jersey, the number 772-9294. You can see the solid vinyl Acrotilt, the finest replacement window available by calling 632-6550 in Philadelphia and 772-9294 in New Jersey. You tell them you want to see the same window that Evil Irving has in his home. Now you tell any real shopper from around here that there's a clover day, and they'll light up. But when you say it's the last clover day before Christmas, well then, they're likely to set the record for racing the Strawbridge and Clothier. Because people really know the significance of this Clover Day. This is the big one. The best of the best. Between now and Christmas, there simply won't be a sale in the Delaware Valley to compare with this one. Compare in size. Compare in savings. Strawbridge and Clothier goes all out to make this Clover Day special. Extra, extra special. And you can use Visa, MasterCard, and your Strawbridge and Clothier charge to bring home the values. 
Check today's papers for a sample of the savings. Then, hurry to the Strawbridge and Clothier nearest you. Because if there's one sale above all sales that you don't want to miss, it's this one. The last Clover Day before Christmas at every Strawbridge and Clothier. Today and tomorrow only. Well, watch for it. You know, linens are Brown's business, so when you need any kind of linens, sheets, towels, comforters, pillows, bathroom accessories, and much, much more, the only place to go is Brown's Linen Outlet. They have an enormous brand name inventory, so you can compare this low, low prices with those at the ritzy department stores. This week is Bargain Bonanza Week. You stop in, and you'll find special purchases on extra special savings, such as terraza checkered dish towels at a dollar each, and dishcloths and pot holders at two for a dollar. Utica, J.P. Stevens Ensemble is offered at half price, so hurry over to Brown's Linens while the quantities last. There's also special savings on the pipeline comforters and towel ensembles by Utica and J.P. Stevens. That's Brown's Linen Outlets. You stop in at any one of their three convenient locations. Parking is always available in Mount Airy and Wadsworth Avenue, in the Northeast on Bustleton Avenue, both of which are open on Sundays, and on North Broad Street in Olney. You look them up in the book. Remember, shop around, and then you'll buy at Brown's. WWDB, the talk station. We hear you. Now is the time to let Dunstan McCloskey check out your gas or oil heating system to make sure it's operating at peak efficiency. An energy efficient heating system saves you fuel dollars. For heating repairs or replacements in Pennsylvania, dial D-U-N-S-T-A-N. In New Jersey, dial 757-0048. For Dunstan McCloskey. Dial D-U-N-S-T-A-N. Dunstan McCloskey. The one plumber to call. N-S-T-A-N. And we're back in the studio here at WWDV in Philadelphia with David Dalton. David is the author of the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. However, he is also a writer and editor. It's a composite of the 20 years of The Rolling Stones put into 187 pages. And I'm sure, David, you missed part of the stones in the original transcript. I imagine you had everything in there, but that would take a 15-hour uh, interview on the radio to really? put it all in. Absolutely. Uh, Did they, and Alan, Alan tolls in this. Alan, if you want to jump in and ask David any questions, feel free. Go ahead, pop in. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, all I wanted to ask David was, did he get a chance to talk to the Rolling Stones, directly to the Stones, or are all the interviews within the book done with people that are from the Stones' entourage, so to speak? Um, well, actually, this book contains uh, two whole sections, really, that are the best of the interviews with the Stones, because uh, some people, you know, have interviewed the Stones so many times, like Nick Kent, Lisa Robinson. They're really experts, and believe me, Mick is a is a hard interview. Uh, I read one the other day where the person arrives, you know, travel like 700 miles, and Mick says, "Hello, welcome to Ro welcome to Longview. I've got no answers." <laughs> so I mean, you know, I mean that's great, you know, like you know what I mean. You're sitting there. Goes, there goes the there goes, there goes your whole story. Um, I would say uh, Bill Wyman was extremely helpful. You see, the thing is that Keith is extremely eloquent on the group and, and how they work and everything else, but not, uh, he's not, uh, doesn't remember what date ne necessarily everything happened. Mick, you know, is, is a wise ass and generally pretends, like if you say, well, did you, were you playing on, was Bill playing bass or something on the, Poison Ivy. Oh, did we record that? Uh, I don't think we did that. No, that was the Moody Blues or something. You know, I mean, he knows perfectly well, but once that's happened, that's it. Bill Wyman is like the memory bank of the group. He remembers everything. I mean, as you can hear the tape rolling, and he contributed a lot of really essential information to this. He's really generous with his time, especially, I assume he's going to write his own book someday, because he's collected everything. He has all the old tapes, and Many things that you re read, I mean, you may have a million and a half clippings, but you know what I mean, you can't read, believe everything you read. 
and many things were totally contradictory and and Bill was extremely helpful in sorting it out and what really happened and you know. david what are, what is the impact of, of of guys like the stones on themselves in the interview what have you arrived any conclusions of the stones in their life for the past 20 years after reading clippings and putting together and researching and looking at pictures and reading these contradictory interviews and and you know the wise ass uh, mick and and is he doing it with tongue in cheek is it part of the act you know what conclusions have oh, you come to? Definitely, Mick is. I, I would say that uh, the, the fascination of the Stones is that you have at the core of the Stones, Keith Richards writes the music. Is like the crystal core. He's a rock addict. He gets out of bed in the morning, plays his guitar. He'll play a riff for three days running, and you know, uh, he uh, he's also the most direct uh, and interesting interview I have ever encountered. I mean, you can ask him any question; he'll answer you directly, and. Uh, around that, Mick kind of whirls his personas or all his, his juggling acts. He's like a high wire. I'm, Mick is like a three-ring circus, you know what I mean? Um, which Mick are you talking to? And in fact, he will, uh, in interviews, if you, uh, he'll say, um, uh, he'll sort of ask you, you know, which which one do you want? I mean, not that you're going to get it, yeah. but just to, just to make you really upset, you know, before you get into it, you know. Um, and we're talking Getting about your punk questions. Yeah. <laughs> Get the usual crowd. You know, right. What do you have for breakfast? Right. How do you love your mother? And, right. and all that jazz. And 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 I imagine he he is he a defensive kind of guy. I mean, he doesn't trust the press. Is that his uh, reason? Or is he, or is he know, just well, like that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Dave. I, I haven't come up with an answer yet. Uh, but the press has been part of their success. The press has, and they do really... They, does it, do they play the press? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They play the press like... Um, like a violin or right, a guitar. Right, right, a guitar. Uh, it, it backfired in, a, in midpoint in their career. But you see, that their first manager, Andrew Oldham, was, uh, used to do publicity for the Beatles, and he basically provoked the bad boy image of the Stones. Um, you know, he one of his famous lines, the Stones are the group parents love to hate. Uh, would you want your daughter to go out with a Rolling Stone? All this stuff. Now, the press loved that. In 1967, when people started smoking grass and taking acid and things like that, uh, the that all that publicity, the bad boy publicity, backfired very badly on them because the press then could not resist nude girl in drug orgy with pop stars. It's, I mean, the most sensational things you could have in one headline without having the royal family in it or something, you know? <laughs> that Lady Diane running around yelling, really? I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. <laughs> really? yeah. So that, you know, um, I mean, they kind of asked for it because they played up the bad boy as opposed to the, as opposed to the Beatles. And, you know, I don't want to say the Stones are not bad boys or that, that they're not not bad boys, but they're not a juvenile delinquents or, you know, uh, especially at this point, they're rather, you know, respectable, you know, grandfathers of rock in a certain sense. I mean, they're living legends of um, of rock history, the walking rock and roll uh, history. Um, they've been around two-thirds of the whole lifespan of rock and roll, I mean, which is unbelievable, you know. Did they design, and I was talking with Alan, and we said, what was the longevity of the Stones when they are here in Philadelphia? And he said to me, it's, it's one of the groups that hung together for 20 years. Right. Was it by design, or did they figure their their business acumen was just such as, hey, we got a good thing going, why should we split? I mean, you know, there are certain basic tenets of survival, and if you're making a buck and you're going good, you don't you don't ruin a good thing. You improve on it, but you don't destroy it. Is there any reason why they stuck together for 20 years that you you surmised? I think that? I think there's a lot of reasons. One, they love to play. They love to perform. I mean, together. they're really together, okay. and they are a band. And you know, it isn't um, uh, it isn't a group of people. And it, in, in a way, uh, that they've withstood. I mean, they obey a certain law of nature. You know, like uh, law of physics of inertia. You keep on rolling until mm. you hit an immovable object. Well, they've rolled through everything. I mean, busts and divorces and women. Uh, bad press. Bad press. I think they they you know they love to play. I would say um, that, you know, the show must go on. I don't think that, you know, this tour is the most phenomenally successful pop rock tour of all time. And I I think that um, they're as surprised as anybody because the last tour, you know, they didn't, I mean, they did very well, but they didn't sell out the same day, all of Boulder or, or something. I mean, that's unbelievable. 
but uh, I think they've stuck together. First of all, you know, like as Keith always says, you know, what else are we going to do? You know, <laughs> go back to an advertising agency, or, <laughs> you know. So, or uh, the other thing is, um, I think that they're because they've got to this point, uh, they're testing the limits of rock and roll. For instance, jazz musicians, blues musicians have gone on playing indefinitely, you know, all of their lives. Why shouldn't rock and roll? I mean, it, it was basically a teenage music, but they're interested in seeing, you know, what happens. I mean, and like they're almost 40 now. And they've made it. That's hard to believe that the Rolling Stones are almost 40. Something else is hard to believe, and that's that clock. Hi, folks. This is Big Al Rubin of Al Rubin Appliances, D in Wyoming, here to tell you about our Super TV, videotape recorder, and microwave oven sale. We have such great values, it will curl your eyebrows. Tell them, Ken. That's right, Dad. We have a Zenith 19-inch portable color TV for an unheard of price of $298. Check it, Dad. A Zenith 19-inch color for only $298. We have a Sanyo video tape recorder for only $448, a tap and microwave oven for just $178, plus so many other values we don't have time to mention them all. And don't forget about our $100 cold cash reward if we can't beat your best deal. Hit it, Dad. That's right, Ken. We've had many people try, but we beat every deal yet. That $100 bill is short burning a hole in my pocket. So, you buy your next major appliance, TV, video, tape recorder, or microwave oven from Al Rubin Appliances, D in Wyoming. See me, Big Al, Sun Ken, manager, handsome Harry, swing your net, smile, and Dennis, so you won't be ashamed of yourself. That's right, folks. Big Al is offering that $100 reward if he cannot beat your best deal. So buy your next major appliance, TV, videotape recorder, or microwave oven from Al Rubin Appliances and see if he can get that $100 out of his pocket. I think he's got it sewed in. D in Wyoming, so you won't be ashamed of yourself. Hello, everyone. This is Bob Grant. What do you do on Sundays? I mean, Sunday afternoon from 3 until 6. Well, whatever you're doing, why don't you join me right here on WWDB? Don't only listen, give me a call on WWDB Sundays from 3 until 6. What's most remarkable about buying your books at Encore is that you don't have to go in one day and get all excited about their enormous discounts and then wonder how long it'll be before you'll ever see discounts like that again. Encore discounts every book every day. New York Times hardback bestsellers are always 35% off list price. And new releases and gift books are always 20% off list price. And there are always lots of books for a buck. So you can save at Encore tomorrow and the day after that and on and on it goes because that's the way it is when you discount every book every day the way Encore does. Jane Brody, award-winning science writer and personal health columnist of the New York Times, has written the soundest and most comprehensive guide to nutrition yet available for the lay person. Jane Brody's nutrition book is vital reading for everyone concerned with good eating and good health. It retails for $17.95 at Encore. It's only $11.67. All 10 Encore book locations open weekday evenings until 9.30 p.m. on Sundays from noon to 5. At Encore, Encore, every book is discounted every day. We're here with David Dalton. David Dalton is the author of the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. We're going to turn you, turn David over to you at 365-4100 on the other side of the news. 365-4100. WW, DB, Philadelphia. The talk station. It's 40 degrees and feeling like fall. Good afternoon. This is Betty Burnaman in the WWDB Newsroom. No certified figures have yet been released by New Jersey's Secretary of State on the gubernatorial contest. But Republican Tom Kane says he'll declare himself the winner and name a transition team in an afternoon news conference. Opponent James Florio, however, plans no statements today. Now, the very latest figures in on the contest and the... David, uh uh, if you have any questions for Dave Dalton or the Rolling Stones, 365-4100. Uh, at the first time we did a program, the rock program, was a school strike. And mm -hmm. a lot of young people were listening to the program, and they all jumped in. Uh, apparently, a lot of kids are in school today, and the parents are saying, Who the hell wants to hear about the Rolling Stones? Well, yeah. listen, folks, I hate to tell you, but that's what your kids are listening to. So you may as well do what I did. I'm trying my best to learn about the Stones and about the music that young people listen to. 365-4100 is the contact number. David, who were the first Stones? How many group, How many were in it and who were they and what happened? How many of the original group is still there? Uh, four are still there. Uh, basically, the, the nucleus of the group is Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. 
they came from the same town, Dartford, in Kent, a little south of London, and they grew up together, uh, went to school for a time together, and around 1960, ran into each other on the Dartford uh, train station. One, um, Keith saw Mick carrying some Muddy Waters records and said, Hey, man, you into that stuff? Mm -hmm. I am too. And I, you know, he, he played the guitar, so they got together um, with a local kid uh, named Dick Taylor and uh, eventually made up with another, met up with a, another talented layabout called Brian Jones, who was um, living with some girl in London. And he was a fantastic slide guitar player. In fact, he called himself... Uh, Brian Elmo or something after Elmo, Elmo James, you know. Um, those three formed the nucleus of the group, and that is um, this kind of sound that Keith and Brian made playing two guitars. If this isn't too technical, um, most groups have a, a bass guitarist, uh, rhythm guitarist, and lead The Stones have basically never had, except for which I'll get into in a little bit, a lead guitarist. They, they're basically two rhythm guitars playing uh, against each other, and it creates a kind of biting, surging, riffy sound that is unmistakable when you hear the opening chords of uh, Start Me Up. You know it's the Stones. It's a, like a five-cylinder engine turning over that group. <laughs> now, they met up eventually with a jazz drummer named Charlie Watts, who used to play with Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated, and... He loved jazz and was totally into it, but um, was a little bored with the people he was playing with who were a little somewhat older than him. And uh, uh, then the f last member of the group, Bill Wyman, joined, who used to play in basically uh, rock bands. Now, rock and roll in England was a sort of a dirty word for people who played blues and R&B. They were the the inner... Uh, they knew the esoteric knowledge. Yeah. They had the you know the Rosicrucian knowledge of, yeah. of you know they knew who uh, Muddy Waters, Elmore James, um, Robert Johnson names that you know people maybe fifty people in London knew, and they're kind of uh, I think the Stones have always been a, a kind of elitist group for that reason because they were into this music before almost anybody else, um, and. Uh, they played together for the first time in July 12th, 1962, which means that next July is the 20th anniversary of this group. And then in the uh, end of January the following year, they became the house band at a little uh, pub uh, on the Thames called the Crawdaddy Club. They played there and put out two records that year, which just barely climbed into the charts. Uh, then the Beatles wrote a song for them. Uh, I mean, um, Lennon and McCartney were great hustlers. It was, uh, you know, like, uh, we need a song. They, they liked the Stones. They, they knew the Stones. And they knew that they were good. Uh, and uh, they said, uh, oh, we've got a song for you. And, you know, so Mick said, oh, yeah, really? And so then they went in, and, you know, they only had like three bars of it. But then they went and finished it and... And the Stones put it out and did a version of that, which is much more bluesy, basically, than the, the Beatles, Beatles would have treated. The Beatles were a pop group. Um, the Stones, after that, they, after the, uh, their first album came out at the beginning of 1964, they shot up in the British charts immediately. In fact, by the end of 1964... Uh, they had like uh, in all the uh, English papers had all these polls, you know, who's your favorite singer and blah blah blah. The, the Stones had taken over, Completely. while the Beatles had moved on to take over America and New Zealand and Bangkok. <laughs> um, the Stones, uh, and by but there was still a cult group here. I, I, uh, I, I didn't see them on the first tour, but I mean, you know, nobody really even knew about them. They came and went. Second tour. Publicist Connie DeNave sent around this picture of them looking scruffy, saying the band that hasn't taken a bath in a week, the Rolling Stones arrive here on Tuesday. This got published in every newspaper in the country. Got them an incredible amount of press, which they hated because they're great shoppers and, you know, uh, 
Brian, in fact, in those days, on that, I was on part of that tour, the second tour. It was called Mr. Shampoo. He used to shampoo his hair twice a day and look at himself in four mirrors and you know what I mean and I mean why he was getting this bad press about not taking a shower right and then <laughs> then the next thing happened to them was that people from the press would say you know hey Brian when was the last time you took a bath well he just you know throw ashtrays and say things that we can't say on the radio here and then they got the reputation of being like these nasty obnoxious guys they just hate the press I think they basically they've, they've always been honest but anyway to get back to the group um in 1969, Brian Jones died in a swimming pool accident, uh, probably taking too much medication and going for a midnight swim. He was replaced in the group. Are by you being a, kind saying too much medication, David? Um, actually, uh, he, he had an extreme asthma problem. He was, um, nobody knows whether it was uh, suicide or what it was, but uh, he was really at the end of his tether, Brian. He had, he was once like the leader of the group, so he titled himself. He was definitely the the teen idol. I mean, uh, great, great looking and great guitarist. He was somebody, unfortunately, that only wanted to be a star. And Brian, uh, once he got to be a star, he didn't care about the music. He didn't care about records. He just, you know, look just at me, get your picture taken in the airport, you know. Mm-hmm. pick up girls and then he got very mean and very I mean he turned into a really grotesque character I mean he liked beating women up and he just got quite went right over the edge he had I think a lot of people that happens to have deep psychological problems to begin with and Brian certainly did and uh, this exacerbated by the success that he had absolutely it only fed all his uh, he's a very self-indulgent person he would take any pill you gave him you know, yeah. and um, after uh, four years of being on the road, th- that can totally knock your nervous system out. Keith is perhaps has taken as many medications as anybody in the world, but he first of all looking for a disease. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we, medicine. we have to pause. We we've <laughs> got to get to the telephones, David, because we're being preempted today by that fellow in Washington, Ronald. What's his name? Oh, yeah. And I, I, I'm sure that the popularity of the Stones will live long after mm-hmm. the popularity of the president. However, Absolutely. he does have the, the ear of the media. You're one of those busy people who brings on the tensions and the pressures of your job and the stress a part of your everyday life if you're concerned with your own personal health and safety or that of a loved one. Listen closely. If you're alone at home, you suffer a heart attack, a fall, or a stroke, how long would you lie there before you get assistance? What would you do if you answer your door and found an intruder there instead of a friend? Well, the Mental Earth Safety Century is perfect for the person who lives alone, someone who has a medical condition that makes you fearful of being alone. You wear a small jewelry-sized device. In an emergency, you simply squeeze this device. The Metal Earth Safety Sentry Communicator notifies a 24-hour emergency monitoring center that you're in trouble. The police, the ambulance service, and others are notified immediately, and emergency help is dispatched. So you call today. Find out how you can stay in close touch with life. For more information or a free home demonstration, you call Metal Alert in Glenside, area code 215-885-0900. That's 215-885-0900. With Metal Alert, you're never alone. 885-0900. Do you know the benefits you're entitled to under Social Security today? Would you like to know how to estimate your monthly retirement check and your hospital benefits under Medicare? The revised edition of your Social Security Handbook will be sent to you free if you call for it now. You will also receive free information about life insurance for everyone age 55 to 80 with no physical examination and no medical questions. Because of a two-year limited benefit period, if you are age 55 to 80, you cannot be turned down regardless of your health. And the Colonial Pen Life Insurance Company guarantees your premium will be just $6.95 a month. So call now for free information and your free 31-page Social Security Handbook. Here's the number. For free information on your free Social Security Handbook, call 1-800-453-4000. This is a free call, 1-800-453-4000. 1-800-453-4000.
Hi, this is Howard Eskin, and you can join me tonight on Sports Talk from 6 until 8 p.m. My guest at 6 o'clock will be Channel 3 sportscaster Rod Luck, and he'll be doing his sports segment on Channel 3 live from the studios of WWDB 96 FM. Also, Thursday evening at 7, Channel 6's Don Tollison will be my guest. Remember tonight, Sports Talk with my guest Rod Luck at 6, only on WWDB, the talk station. Okay, actually... For quite some time now, we've been telling you about Doors Unlimited and their selection of custom steel doors. But did you know they also carry over 100 styles of wooden doors? At Doors Unlimited, they have a door for everyone, from the buyer on a tight budget to the most demanding of taste. And not only do they have wooden steel doors, but they also manufacture a full line of custom aluminum storm doors. Now, whether you're a do-it-yourselfer, you want to install it yourself, or if you would like the professionals at Doors Unlimited to install the doors, that's no problem. Doors Unlimited is the one. So don't delay. You call today, 843-7200, for a no-obligation shop-at-home service or the location of the showroom nearest you. The number again for Doors Unlimited, 843-7200. Outside Pennsylvania, call toll-free, 800-523-0840. Doors Unlimited, unlimited doors and windows, too. And this music is not the Rolling Stones, David. Doors unlimited, unlimited doors. WW ninety six DB, the talk station. Christmas is coming, and I think one of the best gifts you could give your youngster would be the book, The Rolling Stones, the first 20 years that has been on the market now for about three weeks. The author of the book, David Dalton, is here in the studio with me. The Rolling Stones are a living legend. 20 years they have been playing the music that the world listens to. I don't have any figure on how many records they've sold. Do you, David? Do you have any idea how many records? I guess the figure... A hundred million, I would think. It, it's, it's unbelievable. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what your youngsters are listening to, and I learned the hard way that you better learn about it because it ain't going to go away. So <laughs> if you want to know what your kids are into, you better realize that the Stones are part of their life. Even though they may be close to 40 years of age, as David That's right. said, mm -hmm. they're there. So we invite your calls at 365-4100. And Dave Dalton is the author of the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. It is available now in the Philadelphia area, and it's going to make a dynamite Christmas gift for the for the child that has everything, folks. You mm -hmm. get him the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. You're on WWDB with Dave Dalton. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Dave, considering the uh, cut uh, Simply for the Devil and the album Her Satanic Majesty's Request, is there any truth to the fact that the Stones were dabbling with Satanism when those things were cut? Oh, absolutely. They have a, a direct line to the devil. No, I, I would say, you know, that you have to remember they're performers and um, that uh, everybody involved in music has, you know, got some kind of superstition, you know, because, you know, how are you going to come up with your next hit if you don't wear the bone earring or you know this necklace or that ring but I, I would say that Mick's attitude is, um, is is as a performer it's kind of a pantomime and uh, uh, it doesn't mean that there isn't some truth to it but uh, no they don't you know they don't sacrifice <laughs> children no <laughs> well uh, considering that, uh, that uh, the problem that occurred with the Altamont uh, concert when they were singing the song the, oh, the well, actually, that, they weren't singing that song, ironically enough. But, I mean, that's how the press things get, you know, distorted. Uh-huh. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, that, that it's really unfair that the Stones got blamed for Altamont. Uh, after all, uh, the Meredith Hunter did have a gun. I don't know if you saw the film. And, uh, you know, you, I mean, you could say, well, he was going to shoot somebody else. But in a crowd that big, I... I don't know. I mean, you can't say it's justified homicide, but I don't think that the Stones' music created that. In fact, I think that what the Stones, if anything, this whole business about the Stones and violence and Satanism is like any form of art, it exorcises violence. I mean, because it was there. At that period, the end of the 60s, everybody was into some magic, black, white, uh, violent revolution. By singing about it and acting it out, you you uh, brought it into the light. You know, the Stones have always brought our darkness into the light, and that's really what they did. And I think to take it any more literally is to misunderstand the great art of the Stones. Well, thank you very much. I'll be looking forward to reading your book. Thank you. Thank you for calling. 
365-41 is the contact number. We're talking with David Dalton, the author of the book, The Rolling Stones, The First 20 Years. You're on WWDV. Go ahead. Okay, Irv. Listen, I'm with you as far as knowing about stones and... Uh, well, I'm, I'm learning, sir. I'll tell I'm learning. So am I, but listen, uh, now what I know about them since this concert, I knew, all I knew is the name. Believe me. Uh, I'm a 50-year-old man, and uh, I have children. And it's just, just to show you my ignorance, I, I knew nothing about them until this concert came around. Then I started doing a little boning up. And I can't imagine how anybody, after taking a walk or living around a big city, uh, and seeing what goes on, well, the big city for one thing, the scene, what you see out on the streets, reading about what goes on in the schools and what's the, uh, the destruction of, of kids. 12, 13, 14 years old, young kids, how anybody could uh, promote some, something like this and make excuses for, for them. All I can see them as, as uh, a bunch of evil wretches that, uh, in spite of how good they can play horns and guitars and, and how well they understand jazz, David, this is not to interrupt the caller, sir. Hang on there, but David, this is this is the division of the, I guess, the generation gap, and I think the gentleman may have a legitimate, you know, argument that he presents. But is the is the gap between this fifty year old gentleman and the Stones that great that it can't be bridged? Yeah, I would say, <laughs> I, I would say it is. I. I I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I really can't. I think you should read my book, but you know, uh, I, uh, I, I, I don't know what to, how to answer that because I don't think the Stones are evil. I think, in fact, that they have uh, stood up for their own moral, ethical code, which is the code of my generation, which is to uh, reject hypocrisy, pieties, and if that's evil, I mean, evil is putting bombs in people's stores. But evil is not getting up and telling the truth on the stage and that's well, seeing kids in the days walking around on the streets and uh, with nothing in them uh, with hardly life in them and uh, evil is seeing kids uh, in these institutions bouncing themselves off walls like I've seen scream and, and, uh, and just just outside of themselves well are you talking about drugs now huh? are you talking about drugs sure I am and they're, okay. they're, they've done a, a great part them and the the Beatles and Presley and so on. this whole scene has done has caused I would uh, well I won't mention percentages yeah. but they, that's where it's at the kids admire this well let me tell you something you know what I mean like a lot of people take have drugs in their medicine cabinets and this and that. Oh, I, come I, no, on. no, wait a minute. Now wait a minute. Wait, let, 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 let me finish. Go ahead. The, what the, the people I think that have done the damage, frankly, is the press. I mean, every time uh, the, you know a, a Rolling Stone is found with some drug on them, it's all over the newspapers. I mean, if anybody has a moral responsibility, it's the press. I mean, well, you know, another sell another newspaper, another edition. Just you know, uh, I mean, some guy has a habit. A lot of people have problems, you know. Listen, now you know these guys. Uh, they're 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 known to have used all kinds of drugs. And what the kids admire... But how do you know it? You know it from the press. You don't know it. They don't, they don't go out and say take drugs. A lot of groups have, and well, the Stones have you? never promoted drugs. I, I, you know... A man to know what's going on okay, with sir, I think, I think we've reached an impasse, but I, I let the conversation go because that, that David, is, is the crux of what I knew was going to happen once you talk about the Stones, the Beatles, Jim Kendrick, uh, Croce, uh, Mama Cat, the whole spectrum of rock and roll has been some type of devil design to destroy the minds of young people. Right. Now, in any of the research that you've done with the Stones, has that ever come up where there's this division between the old heads like me and the young people that the Stones play to and, and you know, have this cult following with? Well, I think you have to remember that, that my generation grew up with the Stones, and we were totally behind their attitude to life, which was uh, we inherited basically the culture of the 50s, which was very phony, very uh, full of pieties, hypocrisy. I mean, you know, you went to school, your parents told you one thing, you know, uh, don't talk about money, don't do this, and then, then you learn, like, money is the most important thing. I mean, it's like the Stones basically told us the truth. 
And uh, I think that uh, a hostility was generated because, um, you know, like uh, people don't like to be told, you know, uh, you know, your life is completely a mess, and and I'm not going to live my life like yours, you know. The the the. the the question that you brought up and the gentleman brought up, and this is one that I, I still can't resolve and come up with a legitimate answer. Maybe you can, David. He said the Stones are into drugs, and, you know, go through your book, it points out the bus that they made and mm-hmm. run out of New Zealand, etc., and so over in the other countries. And the strong argument, and I can't, I can't counteract this argument, when you say, open up the average American medicine chest, you're going to find more junk in there, you're going to mm-hmm. find more pills pop, you're going to find more Valium that is done mm-hmm. by prescription, you're going to find more people going into the doctor's office saying, I need some type of placebo, mm-hmm. if it's placebo, because people have to have pills to pop, and yet we all heads are going to knock you, David, mm-hmm. and knock your book and knock the stones because the only thing they're going to go to is that one page in there that talks about mm-hmm. the stones being busted for drugs. Mm-hmm. They're not going to look at the artistry of the stones, the ability to create music. The lyrics of some of the songs are mind-boggling. Mm-hmm. They're fantastic. They're not going to go to that. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, absolutely. Has the Stones ever addressed themselves to that in any of their interviews, or do they just say, the hell with it, that's your problem? Sure, We're I mean, you know, Mother's Little Helper, you know, yeah. the famous Stones song, which was about popping pills, you know, uh, she burns her frozen steak and, and takes a little yellow pill. But you see... I, you know, uh... Geez, we're, we're way behind, but ponder, ponder this thought, David. Mama never heard that song about the little helper, right. but the kid did. Right. Okay? Monte Carlo has got everything that is hot, it's playful, exciting, romantic. But you needn't go there, cause the feeling's right here on this side of the Atlantic. Tropicana, Atlantic City's new place. Tropicana, no hotel has its grace. Tropicana, Monte Carlo in field. Tropicana, the excitement is real. Soon you'll be able to experience the premier hotel in Atlantic City, the Tropicana. Done in marble, etched glass, and luxury by the square foot. It's right on the boardwalk, so the ocean views are everywhere. There's nothing like the Tropicana anywhere in Atlantic City. Tropicana, you can play, dine, and dance. Tropicana, it's so south of France. The Tropicana, it's like Monte Carlo in Atlantic City. The number of Swiss pastry mini markets in the Philadelphia vicinity keeps growing. The two newest are in Hoffert's Candies in the court at King of Prussia and in the Thriftway supermarket in Paoli. Now, you see how easy it is? Now, if you can't make it downtown to the original Swiss pastry shop, you stop in one of the mini markets. Order specialties for any occasion. You'll get the quality cakes and pastries the Swiss pastry shop is famous for with one added dimension. Convenience. Pickup is quick and easy. There's no waiting in line, no searching for a parking space, and no delivery charge. Other Swiss pastry mini markets are located in Bryn Mawr, Upper Darby, Wayne, Pennsylvania, South Philadelphia, and Cherry Hill. You call 563-0759 for more information. The Swiss pastry shop... 35 South 19th Street. They've been baking mouth-watering cakes and pastries since 1925. You want me to read the bulletin? You gotta give me a good reason to read the bulletin. Is the chance to win $2,000 a good reason? Well, get today's bulletin and see if you're a $2,000 cash card winner. In fact, buy the bulletin every day to learn if you've won big dollars in the bulletin's $500,000 cash card sweepstakes. From dollars to doctors and an incredible look at the early problems of female physicians. Today's bulletin reports there were actually riots in the streets when the first class of women graduated from the Female Medical College of Pennsylvania. Learn just how bad it was in the good old days. And here's a surprise. In today's bulletin, Senator Arlen Specter says that while nobody likes higher heating costs, they may actually be a blessing in disguise. They could lead to a lot more jobs for Pennsylvania. The chance to win money? Lots of good reading. Lots of good reasons to read today's bulletin. So get your copy and see for yourself why nearly everybody's reading the bulletin again. Sure sold me. How about you? WWDB Philadelphia The Talk Station 
is 40 degrees, cloudy and cold. Good afternoon. This is Betty Burnaman in the WWDB newsroom. Negotiations on a new pact for the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers resume within the hour. While City Council President Joe Coleman today said the $30 million transfer to the schools won't be acted on until a new pact is reached. While latest unofficial tallies from New Jersey show Republican Tom Kane's margin of victory over Democrat James Florio being cut to 1,644 votes, no certified figures have yet been released. And Kane will hold an afternoon news conference conference to declare himself the winner of that gubernatorial race. It's one o'clock.